Yeah, you know, <laughs> normally, normally I would do those. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, I've been waiting for me. Hello, everyone. Good evening. My name's uh, Peter Bonnell. I'm the uh, Quad Arts Program Manager. So, uh, welcome tonight to another talk by Anthony. When was the last one, Anthony? Before the pandemic? That was Apollo 11th's 50th anniversary talk, yes, yeah, that's 2019. So, you've got exactly the dates in your head. So, interesting about dates and a. Uh, uh, oh. I was going to say Quinson, so Quinson at all, we've, we've definitely set it up. But yesterday was the 50th anniversary of the Apollo 17 mission, the last mission, manned mission to Moon, I believe. So what we've got here, through all the things we do at Quad, is to do things that tie into our programs. And as the program uh, manager, program leader, we're always working on things that sort of expand on the exhibitions in particular, or activities that we do across our program. And our season at the moment is, quite broad, but it's called the season to explore. So what better to once more bring Anthony in to talk about one of man's greatest explorations to the lunar surface. So without further ado, over to you, Anthony. Thank you so much for the other talk tonight. Thank there you. Go. There you go. Um, I'm gonna go through this, not quickly, but quickly and because I'm gonna take a look to the future. You've probably heard me talking about art and so on, so you know what's coming. I'm going to show you what's, what's going to happen after this. Um, yesterday, with Artemis coming back, it was a bit bittersweet because I thought Gene Cernan, the Apollo 17 commander, he should have been here to see it because he was one of the biggest proponents of going back to the moon. He said, We've got unfinished business there, we were shut down too early. We've got un unfinished business, we've got to go back. 50 years later, we've got an unmanned mission to go there. Right, so, Apollo, if anyone who knows me, and there's a few familiar faces in this audience who do know me, they know that any chance I go and talk about Apollo, that's it, that you're done for the next three days. <laughs> um, Apollo is very close to my heart. I was two years old when Apollo only landed on the moon and I watched uh, Armstrong take his first steps on the lunar surface. That's about four in the morning, as a two-year-old, because I wanted the TV for him. I wanted to go to bed. <laughs> Come in. Uh, so it, something clicked inside me, and I went, I'm virtually obsessed with Apollo. I was five years old when Apollo 17 went to the moon. A little bit more aware of what was going on. I thought, ah, oh, right, it's not just a pretty lucky one. So I began to understand, to a certain degree. But before I talk about the mission, I'm going to introduce you to an old friend of mine. Sound down deliberately. <laughs> 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 This is where the fun begins.
this first stage for about two minutes, 30 seconds. He just said that was wrong then, he was a command on the pilot. He wasn't expecting that. This was his first one. So now you've got the windows all down. <coughs> then you spend, once you've got the S2 out there now, which is that stage away, you travel at 15,000 miles an hour. <coughs> then when that's done its job, you go on the third stage, and that gets you into orbit, travelling 17,500 miles. And you stay in that orbit for about 90 minutes checking out the systems. Then you fire the engine again to put on the trans Earth, so trans lunar injection burn, i.e., you're on the way to the moon. And you're moving at 25,000 miles an hour at that This was done 10 years ago, that's why I said 14 years. <laughs> Condition itself, um, only one, sort of controversial, there was, most of, most of the people in the astronaut corps, right, we've got at least Apollo 20, we've got at least Apollo 20, right, 
cutting up the crew rotation. And then Congress and the President, thank you, Mr. Nixon, went, no, we're stopping at 17. You are. We've got three more SAP 5 built, or being built. We've got some more lunar modules ready. We've got crews ready to go. You're stopping at 17. seen the contents of my pockets. So finance came into it, but also <clears throat> probably the Vietnam War around the same time, the government had all the priorities as well, so there was different things working against the problem. Um, the other thing was, I think there was a certain amount of, let's quit while we're ahead. They didn't want to kill a crew. They came close with Apollo 13. Very close. But NASA went, <laughs> no, I don't, I don't, yeah, all right, we'll stop at 17. But the astronaut called, no, you want to go for 20, you want to go there, no, all right, fine, fair enough. Then it became, well, who's going to be the final crew, and who are you going to put on the crew? These are going to, you know, crew rotations. If you're, the, if you're the backup to a prime crew, two flights down, you become the prime crew. That's how it worked. So it was going to be Gene Cernan, in fact, let's, let's be honest, he actually beat, beat the rotation, as you'll see later. He was going to be the, he, the lunar module pilot for Apollo 16, we went, no, I don't, I, I don't want to do that. I want to go on 17, because if you get <coughs> that one, you could command it. Another thing, command module pilots usually became commanders of their missions, not lunar module pilots. Okay, so okay, okay, Gene, we'll see what we can do. The lunar module pilot then was an astronaut by the name of Joe Engel, who went on to fly the space shuttle. Um, and Ronald Evans was the command module pilot. Now, being the last mission, the scientific community went, we want a geologist up there, we want a scientist up there. Well, what have we got crew picked? No, they're all test pilots and different. We want a scientist. Well, in 1966, uh, they selected some science, some science, science astronauts. Uh, one of them being Harrison Smith, who you see in a minute. He was he was a geologist by trade, and he helped set up the training, the geological training, for the crews, for the Apollo crew. He got to know the Apollo crews, got on to flight training as well, so he, he knew he knew how to fly aircraft. He knew how to. You have to operate the little module. Perfect. Right, okay. Uh, Joe, would you mind stepping to one side and letting the Schmidt on? Now, if that was me, I would be. They'd have to turn away kicking the screen. If it's last mission, oh no, 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 no. I've I got my seat, I'm not taking that. But an angle, much to his credit, went, okay, fine, fair enough. I don't know much more, but much more beyond that. Perhaps he said other words that I can't repeat if I like one of them. But he bowed out because I think he knew this was the last chance to get a scientist on the moon. So, back to my old friend. That's the Apollo 17 Saturn V on the pack, uh, just before the launch, on pad 39A, which SpaceX now launches from. <laughs> this, now, the Saturn V can be thought of three rockets in one, really, three stages. That's the S1C stage. Uh, 138 feet in uh, long, 33 feet diameter, 5 million pounds fully loaded. Got thrust with the F1 engines at the bottom there of 7.6 million pounds. Operated 2.8 million tons. I said 2 minutes 39. Propellant, RP1 liquid oxygen. RP1 is um, aviation kerosene. Cuts out at 42 miles, gets you to 5,352 miles an hour. Ferrari, eat your heart out. <laughs> and this is actually the, the heart of the, of the S1C stage, the, the F1 engine, which was, which, which, which was in development since the middle 1950s. And it had a bit of a tortuous design um, 
it suffered from com combustion instability. Uh, it means the fuel didn't flow properly through the nozzle, and it just spun round in supersonic speed to such a degree that it would tear the, en the engine apart. How do we, how do we solve that problem? So there, there's what's known as an injector plate. If you, if, if you can imagine a shower head with all your little nozzles where the water comes out, that's the injector plate. That's where the fuel comes out in a sort of finish mist, enough to ignite and start combustion. I thought, right, we'll put some baffles on there then to sort of clean out the exhaust, nicely clean out, and steady the actual fuel flow. That seemed to work, although the odd F1 did still say, I'm not happy with this. <coughs> but they worked, and they went, well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, we'll, we'll just carry on. So the F1 was uh, made operational. That's one on test at Edwards Air Force Base. And it points us to a start, doesn't it? Um, there you go. That's one on test. That's hydrogen, that's oxygen. No, no, that's RP1, that's oxygen. You won't want to be standing anywhere near that when that lit off. That is one at the Marshall Space Flight Centre in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, the average fellow would be there. Probably there. So it's big. And that's what happens to them after a launch. Um, this is the remains of an F1 engine. And apparently, when they got it back and they managed to scrub some of the muck off, they got the serial number, and it turned out to be an engine from Apollo 11. And I think, I don't, I don't know if that's in the Smithsonian now. I don't, I don't know. But it was, but it was recovered. This is the S2 stage. It's 82 feet long, 33 feet diameter, 1.6 million pounds, 1.1, well, 1.15 million pounds worth of thrust. It's got five J2 engines. Operates for six minutes. Liquid oxygen, liquid hydrogen. Because, because the, F4, the S1C, S1C stage did most of the heavy lifting, that's why it needed the RP1, because it's a, a more efficient fuel. Now it's done the heavy lifting, you can use liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen now in your second and third stages. Is that? Yeah. Can you tell me those, those masses there, are they the mass when they're full of fuel? Are they yeah. The, yeah. Yeah. I, I should have put that in brackets actually, but there you go. <laughs> yeah, that, that's fully fueled. Gets it to 60 miles altitude and you're traveling at 15,000 miles an hour at Cotel, at stage. That's how you get one on test. You get a whacking great big train, put on the test stand. That's a flame bucket. I should tell you what you know. It just directs the exhaust out that way. That's one on test. And the oxidizer to fuel ratio is five to uh, five to fifty. This is the bit that gets you into orbit, circularizes your orbit, and gets you on to trajectory towards the moon. The S4B stage, the third stage. 58 feet long, 20, 21 feet diameter, 262,000 pounds. I think that's fully loaded. Uh, thrust, 225,000 pounds, one J2 engine. Operates for two minutes to circularize your orbit, then operates for six minutes to put on a path to the moon. Liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen fuel. Gets you to 100 miles in altitude. Cut out, you're traveling at 25,000 miles an hour. So that's seven miles a second. You need to be going that fast to escape Earth's gravitational pull. And sitting on top, which is usually about there, is instrument unit. This is the brains of the Saturn. This tells all the engines how to steer. Because I don't know if you noticed, there's a lot of tiny fins on the Saturn V. They're not for steering. The engines themselves, themselves gimbal, basically, the 
is a, a series of motors which move the nozzle around, and that does your steering. It's a bit like balancing a, balancing a pencil on your finger. You're trying to keep it stable, and that's what the instrument unit does. It's got gyros, accelerometers, other sensors, and it tells the engines, right, you need to go a bit that way, or we're going, we're dipping up. I said, okay, we're in the roll program, you need to do this. That's the brains of the rocket. There's a command and service module. There's a little bit there. It comes in two parts, command module at the top, and the service module there. I'll bring that in rather worse for a way of looking CSM. And that's it. It's got thrusters, so you can change the attitude. That's known as the service propulsion system. That's the bit that gets you into lunar orbit, and more importantly, out of lunar orbit on the way out. This fails, you're in trouble. You've got to make sure it works. So this used the fuel which is hypergonic, it's two fuels. You put them together and they instantly burn. Put them under pressure, you've got thrust. It's um, nitrogen tetroxide and that metal hydrogen, something, remember it correctly. But you put those two nasty chemicals, I mean, they're nasty enough by themselves. You put them together, they instantly flare up. They instantly combust. The logic being, there's no valves or working parts in this. You just open the flow, <laughs> away you go. There's nothing to go wrong. It's redundant as can be. And they did that for a reason, because they didn't want that engine to fail. Otherwise you're lost in lunar orbit, or you haven't slowed down enough to get into lunar orbit. You pass the moon and heck knows where you're going. But they did put them on a path for the free, free return, so they could come back. That happened. So, if anyone thinks spaceflight is glamorous, think of this. You're in the command module here. It's about 12 feet high, 36 feet in diameter. Oh, no. That's right, 12 feet in diameter, 36 feet high. You're in there, three people and a crew. All your supplies you need in there, your food and all, all your bits and bobs. You sleep in your couches. Imagine being that for about two weeks. Sealed in a, in, in a tin can for two weeks. Does going to the moon sound appealing to you anymore? <laughs> I, I still go, I must admit, I still go. But that's where they lived and that's where, obviously, that's where the mission was flown from the, from the flight crew. The service module held all the fuel for the SPS. In this case, this is the Apollo 15 command and service module. You can see a panel was released. That's the SIMBA, the Scientific Instrument Module. While the crew, the commander of the lunar module pilot was on the moon, the CM pilot would operate the scientific instruments in there to do um, scientific inquiries while in orbit. Radar surveys, there's a laser altimeter so I could work out distances by shooting a laser. <coughs> but that was your home for two weeks. Why is the Artemis no, appears to be no bigger than that? Why is it Artemis yeah. will have a crew of four and it's about one, half, one and a half times the size. Right. So it's still it, yeah. it's bigger than Apollo, yeah. but it's not luxury. It isn't a luxury liner for sure. Yeah. Um, and you still got all your supplies and whatnot. And I was I was watching one NASA. I just digress for a second. I was watching one NASA bit about Artemis and said, "What happens when it comes to solar radiation? If it's a flare off the sun, and you know, oh, um, have you got any way to protect the crew?" Um, hang on a minute. Yes, the technician. This is what we do. Goes down to the goes down to the lower bay, which is just under here. There's a little hole.
hole, he gets there and then pulls bags over his head, which go all through fuel, uh, food and water and whatnot. You can be surprised, water is a very good um, protector against uh, radiation, particularly ice. Things like that in his hole. I'm going, you're kidding me. You know, a couple of cargo bags, and that's going to protect you from a solar flare. Okay, fine, fair enough. Go and ask it, you know what you're doing. So that's what we're going to do for that. Um, in Apollo, they didn't do much better, although they were lucky. In all the Apollo manned flights to the moon, there was very few solar flares, and the ones that happened were pointing in complete opposite direction. It's just blind luck during the Apollo program there wasn't any serious solar flare activity which could have threatened the crew. And you're only out there for two weeks. Um, Artemis, you could be out there for four or five weeks, or even six weeks on a mission. I mean, the same, they, they talk about two weeks stays on the moon. When they've got a lander, of course, that's a different thing. But yeah, so, yeah, Artemis is about one and a half times the size. Just, just enough room to get one more person in, so it's four rather than three. Where's, where's all the payload carried? Hmm? Where's all the payload carried? I've come into that. Well, on Apollo or Artemis. Mm. Or, well, right. most of that is all in here. All the oxygen, all the water and whatnot, all the foods in there in lockers. Commercial lunar module, that, that yeah, that's that, that's that's got its own provisions as well. Yeah. The yeah. So they've both got their own independent supplies. Mm -hmm. um, this is one of the British invention, fuel cell. You react hydrogen and oxygen, and through the miracle of engineering, you, you, you can produce electricity. And the byproduct of that is potable water, drinkable water. So not only does, does it give you electrical power, it gives you water to drink as well. As long as you've got enough hydrogen and oxygen to dig into the system. Which Apollo 13 had a bit of a problem with. <laughs> There's the lunar module. Your home on the moon. People said, well, it's not very aerodynamic, it doesn't look anything like this. Yeah, this doesn't have to go through the atmosphere. It's in there. It's in that enclosure there. It doesn't need to be aerodynamic. Because once it's released, it's in space. There's no air out there. It doesn't need to be aerodynamic. That's why it looks like a train wreck. Um, I think it was, was it? Um, Jim that did it? I think he turned around after one particular um, difficult simulation at uh, Brummen back in May, the lunar module. He couldn't get radar lock on with the simulated surface. Anyway, I'm not flying this toaster anymore. <laughs> he, he called it a toaster. Um, poor thing. Um, but that's your, it's in two, it comes in two, two bits. The same stage. Those were seven and ten, and this end stage is where the astronauts are. Crew to endure them 75 hours of about three days. That's all the gubbins that goes inside. That's the top of the engine cover for the ascent engine. The ascent engine is there. Commander goes here, lunar module pilot goes there. There's all your communications antenna. That's your radar that locks onto the ground and also locks onto the command module during the uh, rendezvous. All your fuels, helium, the bits and bobs, the scent engine cover, the scientific equipment. And on this mission, you'll see, we'll carry the lunar rover, otherwise known as a, as a moon buggy. That was folded up and put in one of these quadrants here, as you'll see. That's the inside, the commander's position there, lunar module pilot position. And that's the hatch on the way out. Now, in the earlier engineering codes, in fact, we'll probably see an example in a minute. 
Grunman put a circular hatch there. But during engineering tests, they had a problem. The life support backpacks are square. They were trying to get a square peg through a round hole. And the, I think it was Pete Conrad, I can remember Apollo 12, he went, this, this isn't working right, he keeps banging it. No, no, you have to change the hatch. Oh, you know, I was going, okay, so what's like that, or we change the backpack? All right, we change the hatch. So the hatch was made square. That's the configuration of the flight. Once, in, uh, once you got into uh, transverse injection, next week, transverse injection, you separate, you move forward, you flip back, pointing back towards the moving module. By this time, these side panels have been explosively released and you dock with the lunar module and you extract it from the third stage and off you go to the moon. While the lunar third stage does a little manoeuvre to get out of the way because most of them, there is Apollo 12s and Apollo 8s, the uh, third stages on the heliocentric orbit, so they're, they're orbiting the sun and every so often they'll come back and say hi. The others, the sent on trajectories to smash straight into the moon. That's how they were disposed of. That's them docked. And here's the different, uh, the different spacecraft. Mercury, the one man spacecraft sent Alan Shepard into orbit. No, suborbital flight. There's the, that's, that's the Atlas that sent John Glenn and the first American orbit. There's Gemini, two-man spacecraft. There's a Gemini Titan launch vehicle. Here's Apollo. And you can see it's got a round hatch. So it dates the, uh, dates the image. And there's a Saturn V. So you can see the progression. And there wasn't a real amount of time before, you know, between all three of these systems. Um, this was being developed while Mercury had been developed. Think about Apollo or a moon mission in the 50s. So all they had to do was come up with the technology. So that this was all going on more or less at the same time. Now the lunar rover vehicle or the buggy. This must be one of the most innovative vehicles ever made. It folds up. Everything it folds up because it's got to go in a quad on the descent stage. Got to fit in there because there's, there's no room you can put it anywhere else in the, in the launch vehicle. So uh, Apollo 12, 14. Um, they didn't, you can't, they couldn't go very far because they had to stay close to the lunar module because they're on foot. Um, on Apollo 14, Edgar Mitchell, lunar module pilot, had um, what he called the wheelbarrow. It's basically a pull on the cart with all the tools and experiments and little bits and bobs and sampling equipment. This is not a good idea to put it in this. Right, we need a car. Okay. What do you want it for? The next mission, Apollo 15. Oh, fine. Right, so went up and designed one. The main contract was Boeing in Seattle. General Motors, Delco Electronics did all the uh, electrical motors. And the navigation was done by Boeing as well. But it was 122 inches, 310 centimetres long, 183 centimetres, 6 feet wide, and a wheelbase of 90 inches, 100 centimetres. That's the weight on Earth. I think I'm going to move to the moon. <laughs> I really do. Um, ground clearance, 14 inches, turning radius, 10 foot, maximum speed, a blistering 8.7 miles an hour, 14 kilometers an hour. Bugatti, I haven't got a patch on that. Range, 57 miles, they never went that far. And you've got 36, oh sorry, 36 volt uh, silver zinc batteries, two of them, and four DC motors to drive the wheels. And the wheels are driven individually, they could move on their own. It's not like on an axle, so you can move it independently. 
So you could actually sort of move sideways a little bit. You could sort of crab over a bit. That's the lunar rover. That's the main communication antenna. That's the TV camera, remote control from Earth. Now you have to be careful how to use this, as you'll see later. It, it, whoever operated the camera. It takes 1.3 seconds for a radio signal to get from the Earth to the Moon. So if you send a signal to that camera saying, right, pan left, it will sit there for 1.3 seconds until it gets a signal and will go, oh, pan left. So you've got to plan your shots ahead of time. That's the control for it. And that's the steering wheel. Well, push it forward, you go forward. Push it back slightly, you go backwards. Left, right, hard back, that's your handbrake. Or if you meant to put your handbrake on when you move hard. So you put it hard back, that's a handbrake. If I remember correctly, I could be wrong, I think, but I think I remember correctly, that little um, bar comes up saying, yeah, the handbrake on. Now, these are all your electrical equipment uh, displays. That is your heading. And you do it in degrees. Because, unlike on Earth, where you've got nice little roads and you've got landmarks, there's no landmarks on the moon, let alone no roads. So it's not obvious which way you go. So you're given vectors on your lunar map to say, right, so many degrees that way, you need to go there. You'll hit that crater there. So you look at your lunar map and go, oh, I'm right, say that. And then match up your uh, degrees with that um, indicator there. Then you know you're going in the right direction. Because you'll see in later images, you can't um, uh, work out distances on the lunar surface because there's no landmarks to latch onto. There's no buildings there, there's no roads. You could be looking into Bowlby thinking, Oh, that's quite close. Could be two miles away. You don't know. And that's where the lunar module sat in quadrant one, just by the just by the ladder. And that's how you deploy it. Basically, you get a rope and pull. <laughs> a frame comes out. Pull another rope. The wheels deploy. That comes out, unfolds, you pull another lanyard, the back wheels um, deploy, then you go around and pull another rope and then move it out a bit further and then deploy it on the ground. Then you've got to fold out the seats, the control panel and all the, the uh, communication antenna, the TV camera, the lot. So it's not like sort of getting into your car and telling shutting the door and switching the ignition on. It's a bit more of a fat, this one. But this was, this was done in a very short space of time. Because when they said we want to go further with these J missions, the science missions, 15, 16, 17, so on, what do I do? How about a car? Oh, you what? Okay, how long have you got? 18 months, two years? Yeah, sure. <laughs> we'll build that in that time. They'll do that. That's it folded up. There's the control panel. Always been put in the lunar module. This is the crew of Apollo 16. There's Charlie Duke. And that's John Young, the commander. And they're looking over the their lunar rover. There's, it, there's the base of it. All folded up. Ingenious. on the moon, a torus which were driving the deployed, the deployed LRV the first time for the test drive. It wasn't exactly the most comfortable of vehicles. It did have a lap belt. You did have a seat belt on your lap. It wasn't the most com comfortable of drives, because you can see there's craters all over the place. And sort of had suspension, sort of. 
But if you want to know what it's like to drive it, Bouncing around. Okay, copy that. You'll see the little magic there. It's quite a bit more cohesive than uh, yeah, it is. Feel the battery here, and then that cohesion goes up towards the. It's a bit of a bouncy ride, so you've got to watch his speed as well. On that, um, I have read that Gene Sermon put his foot down a bit, and I think he achieved the highest speed for the. Uh, a Luna Rover vehicle actually got to. He um, broke the speed limit. Uh, oh, uh, oh, uh, what's happened here? Don't do that. That's it. Now, once you get on the moon, you want to go outside. You can't go dress like this because you won't last too long. You need a spacesuit. And again, another innovation. This is the AL7 spacesuit, pressure suit, a model which is down there. Um, it's in two layers, basically, well, many layers, but this is the, this is the interior pressure, pressure bladder. This is where you reside. These are all the outer protective layers. It's basically your own personal little spaceship. You can get out of the spaceship, and then put on your own little spaceship and go on, go out. There's the elements of it. This is an Apollo 11 suit, actually. Helmet, there's the suit itself. The boots, outer boots, gloves, outer gloves. Watch, obviously. That is a communications headset, which is black and white, and they call it a Snoopy cap. Remember, you can see from Charlie Brown how black he is. Call them sneaky. That is a pair of long jumps. <coughs> Not because they keep you warm, it's to stop you from getting too warm. There's tubes woven throughout that garment and it's close to your skin. And your life support backpack, which you'll see in a minute, has got a water reservoir. You turn that water on, you go to a um, um, And that cold water goes against your skin, cools you off. Because you get hot in a spacesuit, you've got problems. That cools you off. That one, oof, I don't know where I should talk about that. Um, that is how you go to the toilet in a spacesuit. <coughs> um, particularly number ones. And su suffice it to say, most of the astronauts, when they were and for their fittings, <laughs> they all said, can I load one? For obvious reasons. Um, so you wear that, and that goes into a reservoir in the suit, which can be emptied out in the room module when you finish the EVA. Because you'll be out there for seven hours. So if you suddenly get caught short, you can't exactly go find the nearest bush and take the suit off and do the business and then get back on. No, you can't do that. You've got to take the waste with you. I told you, it's best one, glamorous. This is the backpack. That's your oxygen tank, the water reservoir, so it's around here somewhere. All the various connections, it's got the, the radio antennas there for communication. Would the oxygen be liquid or gas? gas, and it was recharged from the room module was supplied. Yeah. You know, very you feel like that a bit this time, you didn't call me out on that one. Why are you on? There's always one, isn't there? There's always one. Um, so yeah, so you, you, you recharge it each time you go out for, for your seven hour lunar um, excursion. The bit about carrying your waste, that's the valve for your number ones. You attach a hose there and you go right and you get rid of the waste. There are the oxygen connections and you've got different layers as well for thermal control. 
You don't want that happening. <laughs> you just go outside and go, oh, no. You know you choose. No. Go leave it. You know what I mean? So if you're out there for such a long time, and if you're in space for a long time, what do you do for food and drink? Well, you have things like this. Don't these look yummy? Um, <coughs> that's beef hash, apparently. That's beef with vegetables, but I don't believe them. Um, these are all freeze-dried, and they're reconstituted with water. Puddings used with cold water, things like that, hot water, which is supplied by the fuel cells on the command module. Same with the green module. So there you are. You're all right, I'm a bit hungry. What are you fancy? It's all freeze dry. Oh. Right, I'll have, I'll have a uh, reconstituted mush in the bag, please. Right, fine. Drinking. Oh, it gets better. Um, well, that's chocolate pudding. And they're bite sized sandwiches. And if you really push the boat out, strawberry cubes. You have some yeah, pudding as well. <laughs> and that's tea with lemon. Anyone getting thirsty? <laughs> <laughs> and that's the gun you use. You go to the thing, put it into the uh, package, hit that trigger there, and just put the water in. Then you've got to knead the food or knead your drink. So it's properly mixed. Then just go, or get, some, or get a spoon. You've got to be careful how you use the spoon, because things tend to float. Do you use that stuff on the space station still? The space station foods are a little bit better. Um, they are allowed, for want of a better word, wet food in cans. You can get canned food. Um, the Russians, they have canned food all the time. And they have like, uh, what's that? What's that Russian beet root? So it's borscht. Borscht? Or what's, that's the one. They have that in effectively toothpaste tubes and just have it that way. Warm it up, obviously. Mind you, I don't care if you have cold or hot, I can't remember. But yeah, it's it's moved on since, and it will move on again when we, when Artemis starts going uh, regularly. But um, another reason why they freeze dried everything and squash everything down is to save weight. There's only a, a certain amount of consumables in both vehicles you can take, because there's only a certain amount of weight that can lift. Food bars. If you're hungry on the lunar surface, have a food bar. And if you get thirsty, that's a water pouch. It's seen better days, <laughs> obviously. Uh, How would they control that then if you've got the space suit on? Hmm? How would they control it if they've got the space suit on? Look into that. Here's a neck ring of an Apollo suit. There's a mouthpiece attached to your. Uh, Water bag. Just suck it. The food bar, you just position it in your suit before you get in and you just go. And as you're doing that, you sort of pull up to, to bring the next, bit, the next bit of it up, otherwise it'll just stay where it is. So if you get hungry and you get a bit thirsty on the moon, you sort it. What's the problem now? Um, on Apollo 15, the lunar module pilot, um, Jim Irwin. They're out for their second EVA on the moon, walking on the moon. Out there for seven hours. And he got back to the lunar module. He took his helmet off his moon. Go get some water. And the commander, Dave Scotland, oh, what's the matter with you? He says, the line to me um, water dispenser got a kink in it. So every time I tried to suck some water, it couldn't get past the kink. He did that entire EVA with no water. He looked a bit dehydrated when he got back to the module, but by gum did Dave Scott tear him, tear, tear him off the strip. Why didn't you say something? To which Irving replied, if I did, Mission Control would have scrubbed the, scrubbed the EVA. They would have scrubbed the moon. But he didn't want to do that, he wanted to carry on. This is the kind of people that went to the moon in those days. They were a different breed. What the Artemis lot will bring to the table, I don't know yet. 
I'm, 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 not, I'm not saying. Um, but these were rough and tumble military test pilots. Some have seen active service, in fact, in fact us all been served in the Korean War, as I remember, through the F-86 Sabre. Knocked down a few MiG-15, so you know, these, are, these are tough cookies. <coughs> now for the mission itself and the crew. That's the mission patch. Each mission had its own patch, usually designed by the crew. That is the Greek god Apollo. Obviously, for the Apollo program. There's the moon. There's the American Eagle. And it's looking towards the future. Saying, right, even though, even though this is the last um, mission, we're looking towards the future. It will not be too long. Yeah, we are 50 years later. <coughs> There's the crew. That is Harrison Schmidt, our geologist and new module pilot, Ron Evans, command module pilot, and Gene Cernan, commander. And it's his second flight to the moon. He was on Apollo 10 with Tom Stafford and John Young. That was the rehearsal mission for Apollo 11. They did everything that Apollo 11 would do on that mission, apart from that. Sarah was born in March 1934, died on the 16th of January 2017. Naval aviator, electrical engineer, aeronautical engineer, and fighter graduate of Purdue University, he joined the US Navy, uh, I think, same year, 1956. After flight training, he received his Navy aviator wings and served as fighter pilot. 63, got a Master of Science degree in Aeronautical Engineering from the US Naval Postgraduate School. In October 1963, NASA selected Cernan as one of the third group of astronauts for Gemini and Apollo flights. And he flew on Gemini 9A. Which, is him. Cernan and his commander, Tom Stafford, were the backup crew for Gemini 9. The prime crew, Elliot C. and Charles Bassett, they were killed in the crash of their T-38 aircraft whilst visiting the um, McDonnell Douglas plant where their spacecraft was being built. It was a foggy day mess up with the instrument landing system and they crashed into the side of the building. That's why NASA has backups, not because if anyone well, yes, yeah. does, but if a crew member can't make the mission, you bring the backups in. So, Cern and, and staff were up. They're supposed to dock with a target vehicle. Uh, one exploded during the launch. The next one got to orbit, but the nose cone didn't separate. A metal strap was holding it. So it looked like an alligator with its mouth open. Hence, they called it the angry alligator. So rather than dock with it, they just flew around it to uh, simulate rendezvous maneuvers. Because Gemini was a test bed for everything they were going to do for Apollo. Also, he's going to do a spacewalk. And he's going to use what's known as the astronaut maneuvering unit basically a jetpack, which is at the back of the Gemini spacecraft. <coughs> so you have to literally, for want a better word, crawl or semi float or whatever, over there. <coughs> but because this is all new, and space, space walking is new, there wasn't many handholds, and he was struggling to keep, keep himself in the right position. Anytime he moved, there would be another reaction, he would go somewhere else. Newton's third, Newton's third law was in effect. You know, could push, you know, do that, and you just push off. There's an equal uh, reaction to what you're doing. He overheated to such an extent that his inside his visor fogged. So he couldn't see. Come back inside. Yeah? Um, where's the hatch? <laughs> and you have to literally, and this is dry from the atmosphere. It was there, and then it got back in. Hence the cooling on. I thought, ah, overexertion. Maybe on future spacecraft we'll put foot holes and handholds. So if you're climbing around the spacecraft at the time, 
you got somewhere you can anchor yourself. Like I say, that was done this before. Then, then it was moving them onto a pilot again with Tom Stafford, and John Young was a primary pilot for uh, Apollo 10. Apollo 10 holds a record for the highest speed attained by any crew. 24,791 miles per hour, which must be turned from the wind on May 26, 1969. Unfortunately, yesterday, Artemis 1 beat it. 25,000 miles an hour. And that was uncrewed. Um, I'm a bit upset by that, because it's taking Apollo's record. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give him that grudgingly. Um, Cern's last flight was uh, commander of Apollo 17 in, in December 1972. Turned down the opportunity to walk on the moon was lunar module pilot of Apollo 16, preferring risk missing a flight for the opportunity to come out and command his own mission. But that was a heck of a risk. Knowing the Apollo program had been curtailed and the last three missions had been cancelled, saying, as much as I like my colleagues and as much as I like John Young, because I've flown with him before, he'll be my commander. No, I won't be in flight. Okay, Gene. <laughs> um, let's see where you are in your attention. So, they were on the surface for three days, as we'll, as we'll see. December 11th, December 14th, in, in, in the Valley of Tori Tori <coughs> The first EVA alone was three times the length of Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin's uh, two-hour um, excursion on, on, on Apollo 11. Um, Cern and Smith covered 22 miles, that's 35 kilometers, using the lunar rover vehicle, and they got 334 kilograms, or 75 pounds of lunar samples, the most of any Apollo mission. And they Oh, there we go. He recorded a speed of 11.2 miles an hour, 18 kilometers an hour, on the NRV. I told you you broke the speed limit. I told you you broke the speed limit. If his operational one was 8.1, how on earth did he get 11.2 out of it? I mean, that's, that, that's some power management, that is. <laughs> How do you give them secrets away now? Yeah. Um, this is Ronald Evans, the command module pilot for Apollo 17. This was his first and only space flight. He died in April 1990. <coughs> Navy man, a actual engineer, uh, graduate bachelor of science degree, US Navy, from the University of Kansas. Joined the Navy in 1956, served as a fighter pilot and flew combat missions during the Vietnam War. He was flying combat missions when his wife went, do you know NASA's looking for astronauts? Oh, no. So his wife went, oh, okay. Sent the form in. He's doing his, his tours at Vienna. now. Gets a phone call from Zeke Swain. Um, I'll short this down because there's a selection process as well. So he gets a phone call from Deep Slate and says, Do you want to be an astronaut? Uh, <laughs> yes. Okay, fine. Report to me. So, bye. Um, he achieved the rank of captain and retired from the Navy in 1976. He was selected in 1966 as part of Group 5. He's the last person to orbit the moon alone, up to now. And at 147 hours and 43 minutes, NAS, after orbit insertion, because for the next three days, his other two crew members were on the moon. So for all that time, and the orbit suspended before they came home, he spent the longest time in lunar orbit of any human. That's probably going to be within the next few years. He performed an EVA to retrieve film cassettes from the um, service, science, science, I've thought now, science instrument module, 
one of these bays here. Yeah, it wasn't round the moon. It was halfway home. It was 150,000 miles from Earth. Fancy a walk, fancy a walk, yeah, fine. Out you go. Guess the film canisters. Oh, we'll see that, we'll see that. Guess the film canisters, pick them up, and he goes, right, I'll go back in there. You'll see pictures of that EVA later. And here's the first scientist astronaut to walk on the moon, the only one so far. And he's, he's the only one with it, without any background in the, in the military. Uh, he was selected as an astronaut in 1965. Prior to that, he worked at the Geological Survey's Astrogeology Centre at Flagstaff, Arizona, developing geological field techniques that would be used by the Apollo crews. Uh, following this selection, Smith spent his first year at the Air Force with the one jet pilot. After that, you get certified as, as flight crew, then you go into the rotation. We all know about how it got onto the, to the uh, mission. Um, he, be, he also became the 12th and second youngest person to set foot on the moon, and the second to last person to step off the moon, as you board the moon once before Eugene Turner. He's the only professional scientist to fly beyond low Earth orbit and visit the Earth. Uh, in 1976, he was elected to be senator from New Mexico for, for the Republican Party and held that position until 1982 when he was beat by a Democrat. That's the landing site in the Highlands. You'll notice very, very in um, topography there. These are all the more real the sea. These are basically flood basalt plains. And the highlands are where it's all more sort of hummocky and hilly and more cratered. And also where the oldest geological rocks are going to be found. So the rocks there are going to be older than these. Which will give you more insight into the history of the moon. That's launch day, saying farewell to the trip to the wives on the 7th of December. That's the launch. Mission duration, 12 days, 13 hours, 51 minutes, 59 seconds. Number of Earth orbits, one. Number of lunar orbits, 75. Landing on the moon, 11th of December, 1972. Yes, there was the 50th anniversary. Three EVAs. EVA one, seven hours, 11 minutes. EVA two, seven hours, and 36 minutes. EVA three, seven hours, and 15 minutes. Return to Earth on the 19th of December. And that's the view of the launch, taken by a remote camera on the, on the, on the launch camera, on the launch pad. Now you're thinking, it's launched at night. Yeah, there's a good reason for that. <coughs> Call celestial mechanics. If you're going to get to a certain point on the moon, you've got to make sure that, A, the moon's in the right place, and your landing site's going to be available, which means the Earth's got to be in the right place. So that dictates when you launch. So hence, launching at midnight. T minus 17, final guidance release. We'll expect engine ignition at 8.9 seconds. 10, 9, 8. And it gets to right. Ignition sequence started. All engines are started. We have ignition. 2, 1, 0. We have a liftoff. Aboard, and I'll tell you about the abort. In the command module, there's a handle called abort, funny enough. If anything goes wrong with that system, with that rocket, you can either abort yourself automatically, or the commander can go right abort. The command module will be explosively separated, and the launcher phase system will pull the command module 
away from the rest of the rocket. The automatic system, which thankfully they never needed, there were three, three wires going all the length of the vehicle. If any one, if, if any one of those three wires lost electrical con connectivity or continuity, <coughs> Computer will go, oh, hello, I'll be breaking up. Bang, get the crew off. I'm thinking, how am I life relying on three three electrical wires? Could I do that? Could I do that? And now into trans lunar injection. This is a view from the ground module, and we're about to extract the lunar module in the third stage. And that's the third stage on its collision course to the moon. Because you don't really want that following you to the moon. <laughs> you want to get it away from you as much as you can. There's a view of the Earth on, after trans lunar injection. And that's, that, is everyone familiar with the Apollo 8 Earthrise picture? With the Earthrise and all the, 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 the lunar surface? This one has no, become known as the blue marble, taken by uh, Harrison Smith. There, you've got Africa there, you've got Saudi Arabia in the Middle Eastern countries there, Madagascar, and there's Antarctica. You're about oh, seventy thousand miles away from, from, from the Earth at that point. Arrival at the moon. There's the moon, and there's the top end of the uh, lunar module. The lunar module is called Challenger, and the command and service module for the seventeen is called America. Now. I've put this picture in for no other reason it is pretty. Well, I think it is. That's the limb of the moon, and there's the Earth. And the crew are going behind the moon. So the moon is going in front of the Earth. So they took that picture. And that's the Taurus Litro Valley. Hmm. Sounds a lot like mountains to me. Dikes. Where the other missions were, went for safer places before the 17. Well, we'll go, we'll go, we'll go for this one. Why were the missions all on that part of the moon? Mainly because if you landed behind the moon, you've yeah. got 2,000 foot of lunar, or 2,000 foot of moon to block the signal. Right. Um, otherwise, you'll probably take a relay satellite with you <coughs> and have that orbit there. That's what they're doing now. There's a launch a few weeks ago called Capstone, and that's around the moon. Yeah, that's going to act as a communication relay. But yeah, that's why they all went on the near side because it's just going to keep keeping communications. Rather than the dark side. Yeah. That's the uh, Man Module of America, the new orbit. And there's Challenger. Legs deployed, it ready for uh, landing. I'm going to take you on a trip to the moon. You're going to land on the moon. From 18,000 feet down to zero feet. Which will, there you go. And they will clip you. Uh -huh.
logic in that kind of configuration you know, right? and moving forward. get to about 800 feet, keep your eye on the crater rim there. You'll see a little black dot appear. I'm not going to say what it is. I'm trying to figure out what it is. Do we know what it is yet? Yeah. It's a shadow of the room. Yeah. 25 feet per second to 400. That's a little high. Okay. 300 feet. 15 feet per second. A little high. Eight shots, a little high. Okay, I've got 60 feet. Okay. The bottom of the landing base is like a spike on all four foot pads, about six foot long. They are the contact probes. As soon as they hit the ground, a blue light comes on saying contact, and you cut the engine and you fall the last six, six feet. So you'll, you'll hear them shout contact. Very, very nondescript is mission control. state and, and set up just in case if anything goes wrong, you can abort using the ascent stage immediately in case anything wrong. So now you're down, what you do next is you go, I'm going to take some pictures. That's a view for the Challenger. <coughs> And that's the view of Gene Cern with the, with the flag and the Lunar Rover, the Challenger. So, now the work starts. That's the surface <coughs> traverses. That's EVA 1. That's a short one. EVA 2. Bit of a drive for the Lunar Rover and the vehicle. And EVA 3, the last one. Another um, NRV rally. All these numbers here are, are all the station stops along. So how far away are those loops? 
Um, from the spaceship, from the lunar module. I think that is pretty good around in wide circles. That's about six or eight miles. Yeah. But of course, you go around this you yeah. know, strange route. So it's long because you go around that route. I think that's about. It's about seven, I think it's about eight miles. But because of these strange loops, it, it, yeah. it's a lot longer. There's the there's the RCEP, which is the Apollo Lunar Surface Science Experiment Package. Seismometers, heat flow experiments, all the geophysical stuff. And a handy bother. Mm. Quite a long way to walk back if you yeah. lunar a vehicle. Yeah. Um, that was that was the worry. That's why they didn't say don't go too far. Because if it goes too far and it's beyond the range of your suit consumables, you're going to put them running out of bed before you manage to walk back to the lunar module. So I said, this far, no further. Because everything's timed. Because you've only got a certain amount of time on your, on your life support backpack. So everything's timed to the second. So you can't go. You can't do any sort of sightseeing, unfortunately. Is there still stuff left up there that's working now? Um, it's up there, but it's working, and it remains to be seen. It's had 50 odd years of um, <coughs> exposure to solar radiation. I mean, the one interesting thing is the fact everyone expects they're still there. They are, but they don't look like that. They're probably white. Because of 50 odd years of direct solar radiation and direct sunlight, it's going to lose the colours off. So that that would probably be a white sheet now. Looks a bit brittle, doesn't it? The footprints are still there, aren't they? Yeah, the way you put it, yeah, you'll, you'll see them later. These boulders come down the the flank of the North Massive, probably from a, for want of a better word, moonquake. A few million years ago. And there's a view of the bowl. You notice know, little pits and stuff there. This is a volcanic rock. Um, but it's impact there because it's been blown from a, from somewhere else to cause impact. But it's volcanic, as you can tell by these little holes called vesicles. It's where the gas in the magma that was it was magma. Um, has come out of solution as the actual uh, magma has been um, ejected. So you get these little holes called vesicles. So that's a, that's, that's a dead giveaway, that's volcanic. So there's no wind at all on the moon? No, no. none at all. None at all. Um, that's Harrison Smith with a rake, not the Adam Baptist garden rake. You put it in the surface, you pull the sample, shake it, and then you bring out smaller pebbles or smaller samples. A bit like the size of that, that one there. You bring that up. <coughs> then you stick it in your sample bag. There's another one there. This one, I don't think it might be one there. And this is, um, I'm going to mispronounce it, a no one, if I've got it right. That tells you how. Well, basically, the colour scale on the moon. I mean, you think, oh, this is black and white image. No, it's not its colour. That's how bland the lunar landscape is. And it can get quite confusing. So, can the lunar rock be classified to anything on Earth? Because it's on Earth. I'll be coming to that later. It's, well, it. I'll come on to that. I don't know. I'll come on to that later because it's a bit torturous. Um, Gene Cernan kept taking photos of any chance he got, and at one point, you can hear on the radio loops, Jack, just take a minute for yourself, just look at the Earth. And the sprint goes, typical, typical science astronaut, typical geologist, I'll, I'll probably say the same thing. He said, ah, I wish you'd seen one Earth, you'd seen them all. And he's wacky moving the geologist around him. Cernan's going, what? <laughs> There's a sample scoop. And one of the sample bags. That's one of the crater. 
Now, this is EV82 the following day. This is Shorty Crater. This one caused a little bit of excitement. at the time, this might be evidence of volcanic activity, a fumarole. But it's short as an impact crater. It's not volcanic. So where, where the heck has this come from? After analysis back on Earth, we find out that these the tectites, volcanic glass, it's stuff that's been erupted and rapidly cooled on the way down and it forms a glass rather than the rock. Have you ever seen obsidian? Same thing. But this has got um, iron impurities. It's a bit rusty, hence the orange colour. And that came from what's known as a fire fountain. It's a eruption from a fissure in the crust of the planet. And because it because the magma's under pressure, it goes straight up in a sheet called a fire fountain. This is about 3.8 billion years old. So whatever, whatever eruption this uh, came from, it happened 3.8 billion years ago. To give you some sense of scale, and that's, that's actually not my title picture, but that's the Rim Shorty Crater, just to give you some sense of scale. Bear Mountain. Now, just like any other motorist on Earth, you can have accidents on the moon. Um, Gene Cernan was walking near the uh, lunar rover and he, he felt something move. He went, oh no. I saw him, nothing. Drove off. As soon as he drove off, dust all over the place. Where's this dust coming from? I stopped. Ah, oh, no, I've broken one door. Americans call them fenders. He says, we can't move, we can't do any more, because we'll get dust all over the place. What are we going to do? Do you know where it went? No, it was two miles away. It could be anywhere. Hang on a minute. So he pulls out two clamps, a lunar traverse map, and the most important invention known to man, duct tape. <laughs> and just stuck it together. At the end of the mission, Cernan got that, returned it to the land, took it back to the command module, and that's now in the Smithsonian in Washington. So, he had a stuff, you got any maps, you know what to do. That's a view of the Earth again. Uh, Gene Cernan's out, out with his camera again, and we're about to go back inside. It's a large boulder, it's frightening to think that something of that size, that's come from the ejector from an impact. Huge. That's been thrown out because another bigger lump of rock has gone bang, excavated the crater, thrown everything out. And it can throw things like that around, like the randoms. Frightening. I mean, all right, this is, this is one six gravity, and this is a lot more gentle, but I wouldn't want that falling on me in, in one six gravity. So in the LRV, from the Henry Crater, this is towards the end, and I think this, this is getting close to station eight. And show you the force of these impacts. And his name suggested fractured rock. Now, the interesting thing is, 
Because it fractured when it landed here, when it was ejected from the impact that which formed it, or was it fractured as a consequence of the impact? I haven't found this out yet. Um, there's another one. <laughs> More ejector. Bigger than the last. And that is the Lunar Rover's resting place. It is, it is there to this day. Now, whether it's operable remains to be seen. <laughs> I think the batteries have died. Um, but it will still be in that condition. Um, hopefully. It will still be in that condition if they ever go to the Apollo 17 site number one. Would not solar radiation have done anything to it? Probably. It may have taken the coil off that. I think the mylar will still be gold. But that, the, the mud guards, I refuse to call them things. The rules of mud cards will probably be discovered by now. Again, another um, ejector uh, feature. Traces Rock. It's called Traces Rock because before the mission ended, Gene Cernan went, ah, I know what I'll do. Because he kept saying to his daughter, I'll bring you back a moonbeam. one better. He got the sample return handle and on this rock and I don't know if it, if it was under come on batteries, come on <coughs> I don't know if it was underneath or where it's formed somewhere here but he scratched the initials TDC his daughter's initials on the moon. They're still there so Tracy Sermon has got her initials on the moon I don't see on the moon now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the lunar art. Can't beat it. Now, when I said about sense of scale and sense of distance, can you tell me where the Challenger is? There you go. Right there. And you're about, I think, three miles away? But it looks further, at least to my old eyes anyway. It, it looks further. And that's the problem with judging distance on the moon. There's no easy way of doing it. Now, I've done geological uh, field trips in my university days. And I must admit, I've never thrown my geological hammer. I've had the temptation to a few times, as a few targets, but I've never thrown it. At the end of the mission, Harrison Smith went, come on, can I, can I throw the arm? Was throwing equipment away, and that's the picture that Cernan took of the hammer in mid flight. <laughs> that streak at the top. Once you go back to the end, we're back with the ceremonies, and uh, there's there's been a plaque on each of the lunar modules saying did the Big Streaks mission. And on this one, it said, Here man completed his first exploration of the moon. May the spirit of peace in which we came be reflected in the lives of all mankind. Did that, and with other bits and bobs done, and throwing your life support bits out, you get back in the lunar module. But not Cernan. He was still outside. And he said this, Bob, Robert Overmeyer, Captain, Captain back at Houston. This is Gene, I'm on the surface. As I take man's last step from the surface, back home for some time to come, you won't believe how long. <laughs> um, but we believe not too long in the future. I like just I like to, to just say what I believe history will record that America's challenger today has forged man's destiny of tomorrow. 
And if you leave the moon and Torah Pletra, we leave as we came, and God willing, as we shall return. With peace and hope for all mankind. God speed the crew of Apollo 17. And with those words, he got back in. And the mission, at least on the moon, was over. Now, interesting aside, can you see the state of his spacesuit? The lunar dust is electrostatic. It just clings to everything. Not only that, but it's angular and coarse. And then notice, if you're out for long enough, you've got bearing joints in the wrists, in the gloves. The dust will get in, and all of a sudden it'd be difficult to turn the wrist, because it was affecting the ball bearing joints. And they were messing up the suit. That's going to be a problem when we go back. Lunar dust will be a real problem. Uh, Apollo 12, lunar module pilot, Alan Bean said, when they got back in, he says it was horrible. I'm sure, particularly when they got back in the uh, command module, everything was floating about, because you've got all this dust on the suit. He says, I've got, my eyes kept running, I've got stuffy, stuffy nose, I felt like I could breathe. He was inhaling lunar dust. That's going to be a problem. How do you operate on the lunar surface in a spacesuit? And then you come back inside to your lunar habitat and you go in because <coughs> you're choking on the dust. <coughs> We've got to figure out some way of getting the dust off the suit before we go back inside. Lunar dust is going to be a real problem to fight. I mean, look at, look at Schmidt. Look like he's been down a coal mine. So, everything squared away. It was time for launch. Now, this is a bit about timing. There was a fellow back at Mission Control called Ed Fendel. He was controlling the camera. Now remember, 1.3 seconds between um, a transmission leaving Earth hitting the moon. So you've got 1.3 seconds before that camera moves. You go, my seconds at that time. Right. He had the most, probably the most nerve-wracking job in the world. He filmed this. He's moving the camera now. Three, two, one. He timed it perfectly. They tried the same on Apollo 15 and Apollo 16. Apollo 15 missed it completely. Apollo 16 just saw one video after the ball. I wouldn't want to be in Ed, Ed Fendel's shoes on that day, I'll tell you. And this is after the left. There's the ball. <coughs> That's the descent stage. And there's the flag. And that was that. They're on back on the way to rendezvous with Ron Evans. There's the same stage, rendezvous. There's a little view of it. There's the scientific instrument there. There's Ryan who's doing his EVA to get the film canisters out. And the next picture, again, I hold my hand up to this. I'm, it's only in here because it's pretty. Evans and the Earth. That's taken 150,000 miles from home. So they came back on the 19th of December to a splash down the Pacific Ocean and recovered by the USS Ticonderoga, which, ironically enough, was the ship that Ron Evans used to fly off during his flight days. So he was picked up by the ship he, would, he, he served on. There's the recovery. That's the inside. Remarkably clean, actually. It's edge of the man and women. And grubbing. The uh, con 
contractor to the Hoover module, release this at the end of an era. That's the only one. And that's the Apollo 17 uh, command module uh, on display at Johnson Space and Detector. It's the Apollo 10 command module, the surgeon is on the right. That's at the Science Museum in London. And Neil will know because he's, he actually seen me do this. But the Chen's the gallery, the gallery says, but when he used to go, you could get quite close to it. And when we were going, I just I just look around. Make sure no one's looking. Go over to the level and go, see you next time. Pat it goodbye and just go. <laughs> we went to the Science Museum a couple of years ago. The Chen's are displaced in a different gallery. It's on a plinth, you can't get near it. No, I can't, I, I can't say goodbye to it. Now, you said about the footprints. There's a the footprint, and that's the traps for the LRB. These double ones here. There's the flag, there's the, the center stage. This was taken in 2009, Apollo 11's 40th anniversary year, um, by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft. What I'll do, because I'm, I'm conscious of time, we've got items to go, I'll, I'll go through this quickly. Apollo's legacy. Um, interesting. We've learned a lot more about the moon, and we've learned we can land on the moon, and we can operate on the moon. Cernan and Schmidt stayed on the moon for three days. Cernan says, I lived on the moon for three days. I had a job, I had a house, I was there for three days. We know how to do it. Now we know how to, now we need to know how to do it for longer periods. That's where Artemis comes in. This I've got to sound cynical now. This was born of politics, Cold War. Completely. I will not say, oh, it's for the well, it's the exploration. But there was a political motive behind. It became something much more than a Cold War scrap between East and West. It defined what we can do as a species without sounding too pompous. It defined us. That's its real legacy. So for the future, I'll go through this quickly. Not because I've got anything wrong with the Artemis program. Artemis. Um, it's in a rather a tortuous beginning. Back in 2004, when George W. Bush said, right, get rid of the space shuttle, but we're going back to the moon with the Constellation program. Yay! Cancelled. Cancelled by Barack Obama, actually. Um, and it languished for a few years until someone at NASA went, no, we need to do this. Gene Cernan, who was still alive at the time, he banged his fist on the table, look, we've got to go. We've got unfinished business there. Why have six landings there and then just walk away and say we're going to Mars? Why? No. Let's get the moon done first. If we can crack the moon, then we could probably do a Mars mission. Okay, fine. So they come up with Artemis. Now, Artemis was Apollo's sister, goddess of the hunt. So they're keeping the Apollo theme going, but they've got they've got your sister instead. That logo control work again. The red bit is the track to Mars as it, as it's going past going past the moon. So I want to go to the moon first, then go to Mars, but let's do the moon first, it's easier. So where are we going this time? Well we're not landing on the near side. We're landing at the Lunar South Pole. Why is that? Because a few years ago, a few probes um, did some uh, analyses of these craters here. There's ice deposits in these craters, <coughs> water ice deposits. Because these, cr the, these craters don't get much sunlight, the water can say it, it says ice, it doesn't boil off. <coughs> it's not too far away from the surface either. So, Water. Once you got water, you got oxygen, hydrogen. So you got rocket fuel. You can combine it to make water again. You got oxygen to breathe. You got a resource for a base. Right, we'll go there. 
How are you going to do it? Um, okay, fine. That is a map of the water body. It's up the lunar south pole. That's the moon and the north pole. It's got a little bit less than the south pole has. This is how we're going to go <laughs> back to the moon. Artemis 1, which we've just seen, or we'll see in a minute, has just been completed yesterday. Artemis 2 is the first flight of humans. Artemis 2 is going to do an Apollo 8, a crewed mission round the moon, back up. That's the one. Then there's going to be support missions, and it's going to build what's known as the Gateway, which is going to be a lunar orbiting spacecraft, which is going to act as a motorway service station, if you want to put it that way, so you can dock with the gateway, do what you need to do, transfer to your lander, go down to the moon. That's going to be an intermediate step, and that's where you can refuel and whatever else. There are your landing systems. Now, here's the thing. So it's Artemis 3. I'm going to go to the lunar surface. Okay, fine. Forming your plan. Gateway's not built yet. I don't think it's off the design board yet, actually. Okay, fine. How are you going to land? You don't go around it. No. How are you going to get to the surface? Send it out for competition, commercial competition. These are the three. Elon Musk. <coughs> Wash my mouth out the soap and water. Um, so I'll use one of my starships, which hasn't even flown yet properly. It hasn't had the orbital test yet. So you can use that cargo one. Yeah, but how did they get down? Oh, I'll just pull down some ropes. Brilliant, Elon. I can see why you're a billionaire. Yeah, yeah. yeah but that was only 12 foot off the ground. <laughs> There's this design from Dynetics, another one. Um, Jeff Bezos of Amazon and his rocket uh, company Blue Origin, they submitted a uh, design which doesn't uh, appear here. And NASA went, no, we'll put it with SpaceX. What? Lawsuit filed, <laughs> held things up for eight months because Jeff Bezos, Bezos didn't want to be outdone by Elon Musk. Fair enough, so he put the program back. Now, NASA said, all right, we'll rerun the competition, but for Artemis 3, we're using that. Okay, fine. The gateway, the lunar space station. <coughs> Stepping stone to Mars. Yeah, all right, I believe you. That's its pieces. That's the lunar module. That's not what has been decided. That's just a concept. There's all the various modules, what you have with that. Uh, cruise, uh, cargo supply uh, vehicle by uh, SpaceX. That's another uh, logistics module, uh, cargo by uh, Japanese space agency. Canadians involved, European space agencies involved. Yeah. They're not built it yet. How to get there? You need a rocket akin to my old friend here, the SLS, the Space Launch System. And these are the variants. The Glock 1, which took Artemis on its trip uh, last month and brought it back. This is the Glock 2 for the crew. That's the Glock 1 for cargo. That's the Glock 2 crew. And that's the Glock 2 cargo. And you see the thrusters are thrusters going up. Particularly for the cargo one, <coughs> the cargo, the, the block two. So they're going to outstrip the Saturn V, which I don't like. How dare they take the record off that magnificent piece of technology? <coughs> this is the block one spacecraft that took off on the, you know, the, the, November the 16th. All this is new, even though, even though Artemis is basically one of these, but 1.5 times larger. 
holds a crew of four. There's your launch escape system. Got two solid rocket boosters to give it extra thrust. And four RS-25 engines, which are repurposed space shuttle main engines. We've got 16, enough for four flights. These were reusable. These were thrown away. Got uh, five segment SRB, solid rocket boosters. The shuttle had four. This is a, want a better word, evolution of the orange external tank that the shuttle used to reside next to during launch. So this is pretty much, apart from this bit here, these elements here, this is built from shuttle legacy technology. That thing was built from scratch. They had to invent an awful lot of the alloys that made that vehicle up because it didn't exist before. We're just sort of repurposing things. It's a bit worrying. That's the block one for the uh, the block one B for the crew. It's got a different exploration stage. The same Orion spacecraft. There's Orion. That's the European service module. And the service module, unlike this one, doesn't use um, fuel cells. It uses solar, solar panels. Uh, the fuel cells, you're limited by amount, how much you've got consumable-wise, i.e. hydrogen oxygen. Usually two weeks, two and a bit weeks. If you've got solar panels, you've got indefinite energy. That's the cargo vehicle. The cargo will go in there. 10 metre fairy, 30 foot tall. Now, whether they're going to put a lander in that, not just cargo, I don't know. They probably are. But my knowledge of this particular variant is somewhat sketchy, so I apologise if I've got anything wrong. This is the mission, mission patch. I'll just finish off with uh, Martin's. This is the, this is the mission patch. Uh, we had two launch attempts before it finally got off the ground. Um, there were fueling problems, they had a leak in the hydrogen lines. Not what you want before you launch. So I put the launch back until November the 16th. There's your Orion spacecraft, there's the launch escape system. There's your third stage, basically equivalent to that. It's got cube sats in here, because more science satellites. Um, all of them, like this one. This one's currently working, Argo Moon, image the SRS engine crying project, project propulsion stage, the third stage. Near Earth Scout, solar sail with base cubes that can set near Earth asteroid 2020 GE in September 2023. That has failed. As the 12th of December, contact's not been established. I think it never lost that one. Uh, Another one is Bio Sentinel, basically sending yeast up on a CubeSat to see how it reacts to solar radiation. That's operational. Lun Lunar IR. Uh, in, uh, that would do a lunar flyby, uh, collecting spectrography, spectrography and thermography of the surface. Possibly looking for lunar water again. Lunar Ice Cube, again, looking for lunar ice. CubeSat for, Cube for solar particles, basically that's um, studying the solar wind, the stream of charged particles that the sun emits. Uh, contact time for 60 minutes, point of deployment, then contact with us. Lunar polar hydrogen mapper, the hydrogen, so if you find hydrogen there, you're going to find oxygen, hopefully. Equus. Uh, equilibrium lunar Earth point 6U spacecraft. It's a measure of distribution of plasma that surrounds the Earth and helps scientists understand radiation environments in that region. That's operational. Uh, oh, no. Um, it's a got it's a small spacecraft, it's got a a lander. Okay, I think that's about the size of a shoe block. Um, that's gone dark. We lost contact with that. That's the Artemis vehicle. These are the shuttle engines it's using. And these are the flights, the last floor. 
the one in 2011 or the one in 2010? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. I've got the dates on that. But you know, his missions are through. So these are previously flown engines. They've just been thrown away. We've got three groups of four like saying, oh, we're going to build some more. Oh, yeah. How many flights are there now? Because you've got cargo ones as well. How many times have there been built? NASA's not saying. There's the Artemis flyback, and as a comparison, Apollo 8, the first time humans left the, left, left the confines of the Earth. That's the launch on the 16th of November. Um, I was watching the live feed of that before I went to, before I went to work, I had a cup of coffee, and I'm going, come on, <laughs> come on, we've <laughs> waited this long, please take off. Biting me, fingering down to me knuckle. And it got off. You know, now, once it got into orbit, it took this view from a camera on the third stage. There's the core stage, there's in Jettison. And that's the view of the spacecraft. That's the service module. Command module there, there's a solar panel. That is the propulsion system for the service module. That is a repurposed space shuttle orbital maneuvering engine. So there's two bulbous things at the back, either side of the tail. Well, that's the engine that's on it. What's Again, the, what's the little one? Hmm? What's, the, what's the little cabin? The other ones are like Yulish um, um, thrusters, that's just sort of make sure the fuel is in the right place at the right time. If you thrust them, it comes to move the fuel back. If that makes any sense. Keep the fuel in the fuel line. Again, these are hyperbolic propellants. So there's no valves. The other ones you can see looking around are reaction control, control thrusters. They move the spacecraft around, change its orientation, sort of move it around. That's a view of the moon. Obviously. That is Mayor Moscovitz, Sea of Moscow on the far side. We're approaching the moon here. I mean, when I said in the uh, beginning video, why go back to the moon, high definition. I think you can agree. <laughs> we got the high definition, sure. That's the far side of the moon. There's more, uh, more reading. Scrap it, it should come from the, one of the navigation cameras. And there's a moon crater. I think that might be Copernicus, I could be wrong. And this has put an engine burn, it was 80 miles away from the moon's surface, and there's an engine burn to put it into a distant retrograde orbit. Put it 70,000 miles beyond the moon, and then track the moon for a bit before coming out. Shades of 2001. Just imagine the music still. That was taken by Orion, yeah, the Orion spacecraft, while it was in distant retrograde orbit. Again, no other reason to put it there, apart from it's a pretty picture. There's a selfie of uh, um, Artemis 1 and Orion with the Earth and the Moon. This was yesterday. And again, biting, biting me again. <coughs> Got the live feeds up, you can see what's going on with 1L34 in. And there's, there's the Earth. <coughs> Get a bit closer. And I'm starting to sweat now at this point. I'm going, oh, no, no, please work. By this point, um, the um, service module has gone. You've just got the Orion capsule. And it will follow. Pretty similar way to the way the um, Apollo capsule came in. You come in for a bit, then you jump out and then dip out and then go in again. That's the way to bleed off speed. Because at the moment you're entering at 25,000 miles an hour, you've got to slow down really quickly. So you come in, skip out a bit, go back in again, and then you do what's known as a roll reversal, which is move the spacecraft around to bleed a bit more energy off as you 
head towards the landing zone. That's exactly what um, Artemis did. And this is generated, generated from uh, spacecraft signals. So this graphic is linked to all the telemetry coming from the spacecraft. And joining, joining the range of these two periods where there's, there's blackout, because you're coming in so fast, the air is trying to get out of the way, but it can't. So it, it produces friction and causes a plasma to form outside the capsule. <coughs> the temperature that that heat shield's got to deal with is about 3,000 degrees, half the temperature of the surface of the sun. I think in Artemis' case, I think we're talking 5,000 degrees. So you, um, at this point, I was thinking, I hope we got the maths right with the heat shield. So, 24 minutes to splash there. I've got shoots open now. <sighs> By this time I went, I think I need more than my coffee at the moment. And that was splashed down. So, 50 years, it, it was on, watching this, but also thinking, I've got to put this in a presentation about a mission that happened 50 years previously. I'm not a time lord, I haven't got a time list, but I'm living in two timelines. I'm getting confused here. It was a weird feeling. And that's it, bobbing in the ocean, ready for recovery. Would that still be red up when it came down and landed in the sea? Um, probably, but you won't want to go near it immediately because there are certain gases that will come off, um, mainly ammonia from the cooling system. You don't, because it, it automatically vents them off. So you don't have to go, right, I'll make sure the spacecraft's all right, it's still on you. Oh, can't breathe. So you stay away from it until it's automatically vented. Even though the Navy teams that went in and the Navy divers that went in to secure it, they secured it, but they stayed away from it for a bit longer, so it off-gassed as well. And there might be one or two gases come up the heat shield as well. So you don't touch that until you know it's safe. And if you want to know anything more about Apollo 17, even join the mission, there's a resource, an online resource, called Apollo in Real Time. And the URL is at the bottom, apolloinrealtime.org. And it's got three missions, the complete missions. Apollo 11, Apollo 13, <laughs> and Apollo 17. You can join it at T minus one minute, or you can join it while the mission's in place. At the moment, they're still on the surface. But I'll warn you, whenever I've done it, I've miscalculated, because half the time when I join it, you're on a sleep cycle. All I hear is static. So, <laughs> so get your time to look, it's a fantastic resource. You've got videos playing, you've got the audio coming through, you've got a transcript when they come through with NASA PAO, public affairs, doing bulletins, you've got pictures coming up at the right time, fantastic resource. So that only leaves me to say thank you for your attention. I was going to say there's any questions. You know, on the patch, is it a plane? Or what? There. Or there? Above the eagle. It's Saturn. Oh, oh, right, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's Saturn, mate. I'll ask a question. You know the miles that you give for Apollo 17? Mm. Are they American miles? Are they different to. They the probably thing? would be the same. Because they're different, so are they different? Nine miles are the same. Well, the 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 and yes. yeah. 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 Got that bit wrong. Um, so that yeah. 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 That's the public affairs office, always talking in imperial, feet, miles, inches. 
Elon describes that world. You go to the European Space Agency, uh, kilometers, what's that? Like? <laughs> so NASA's the only space agency that still works with the Imperial system. It's not just the space agency, I think it's most American countries. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, she comes back to me, yeah. Yeah. Um you know, decimal point in the wrong place and he fired his engines at the wrong time to the wrong man and just smashed into the ground. Yeah, yeah, that yeah, that was a confusion of the um conversion factors. Yeah, it can happen. It's not perfect, but it can happen. Did all of the uh, did all of the Apollo missions spend a similar amount of time on the surface then? No. Um Apollo sixteen did Two and a half days, that'd be sure. Um, same, same with 15. But they could stay out long because they had the rover. Um, Apollo 14, I think, in their three EVS, I think they only did a day and a half. Because they were on foot, so they couldn't go that far away from the lunar module. Because then, obviously, you've got a limited amount of time and stuff in your backpack. The lamb can support a crew for 72 hours, yeah. and then you've got to go. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, Apollo 11, no, you had no time at all. You had about enough time to do your two hours of EVA, and that was it. Back in, because it's a case of land, flag, sample, home. That's all you've got. I think it's a shining example of how you can do more with less, really, because you've not got much room in there for extra stuff, and you certainly haven't got much room in there for extra stuff either. So to come up with a origami car, want to be better with it, yeah, that's some some kind of engineering under a very short space of time. Side, just to put it in, into perspective, they're talking about for our new standard at the moment, pressurized rovers. That's nothing new. They were talking about pressurized rovers in the back end of the 50s, early 60s. Oh, tell you what, can we use a pressurized rover if we go to the moon? And was it going to work? Um, so you that weight constraints coming to the and the engineering. But they were thinking about pressurised rovers before they came up with the LRV. So it's it's nothing new. It's just been going back to it. Yeah. If you look at the SpaceX lander, it looks like what's his name, Chesley. Oh, Chesley Bonstar. Yeah. 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 Yeah.